Hello, today we are interviewing Martin Herrer, laureate of the Fields Medal 2014 and famous mathematician. Martin Herrer, welcome and thanks for being with us. Well, thank you very much, it's a pleasure. So, you've been awarded the Fields Medal last year and you came at Ecole Polytechnique to do a series of advanced lectures in mathematics organized by the Adama Foundation. You work mostly on uh, differential equations, more particularly stochastic partial differential equations. What is it and why is it relevant for today's mathematics and science? Okay, um, yeah, so maybe I can explain first what differential equations are. Uh, so they are the equations that govern most of uh, nature. Um, for example, well, the motion of the planet. So, for example, a differential equation would tell you how uh, the Earth orbits around the Sun and how the different planets of the solar system interact with each other. Um, a partial differential equation is one that furthermore involves space. So, in the case of the uh, planets, the solar system is just described by the positions of each planet and the velocities of each planet. So it's just finite number of data. Um, if you want to describe something more complicated like uh, a fluid, so for example you want to uh, describe the motion of the gas in the reactor of a jet engine, um, then now you have to describe the velocity of the gas at every point inside the jet engine all of, at every time. And so now it's not just a finite amount of data, but it's really for every point inside the jet engine, you need the velocity. Um, and so now that this is called the partial differential equation. So it describes these kind of systems. And stochastic partial differential equations um, are partial differential equations that furthermore involve randomness. So one example would be if you take a magnet, so you take a piece of iron, which, has, um, which is a magnet, has a magnetic field, and then you heat it up. Now what's going to happen is that the magnetic field is going to get weak, weaker and weaker. And at some point there is what physicists call the critical temperature, which is one temperature at which the piece of iron loses its magnetization completely. Um, and now what you're interested in is describing what happens near this critical temperature. So if you're close to, but still just a little bit below the critical temperature, uh, what starts to happen is that in the magnet, the magnetic field starts to fluctuate. So instead of having the same magnetic field everywhere, uh, it maybe points in one direction somewhere and points in a different direction somewhere else in the magnet, and it starts to actually fluctuate as a function both of time and of space. And these fluctuations are random, so you cannot predict them with certainty you can only predict the probability that certain fluctuations happen or you, can, or you see certain things. Okay, so that would be an example of a stochastic partial differential equation. So I believe you are Austrian, mm -hmm. you grew up in Switzerland, you've held the position at NYU and you are now at the University of Warwick in the UK. You also speak fluently French, German and English. What an international <laughs> profile. Uh, to what extent has this international background shaped your career so far? Uh, I think it, it helped in uh, making contacts with mathematicians within Europe. So, it, I mean, it helps very much to be able to speak French. So if I go to France, I can speak French with the researchers in France. And if I go to Germany, I can speak German with them. Um, it, it makes communication much easier mm. somehow. So, um, in a way, the one of the disadvantages is that then you end up being much in demand on committees because people like to have somebody from a different country, but then they still like somebody who actually speaks their language. <laughs> you have been invited in the most prestigious institutions all over the world, in the US, in Asia, in Europe. So you've seen a lot of different research environments. According to you, what are the main challenges facing mathematicians and scientists today? Well, so of course in mathematics there are still there are many, many interesting open problems. Um, I think maybe one, one problem which would be 
interesting for mathematics uh, in the future and also not just for mathematics but also for physics, biology and neuroscience uh, is the understanding of how the brain works. Right? So that's one example of a problem where one still doesn't have any understanding at all. I mean, one has some understanding of the mechanics of how the brain works, but one doesn't have any idea of why you know, the brain really behaves like the brain does. So right now the understanding is somehow at the level of understanding a computer by smashing it into pieces, uh, taking some of the bits, seeing, oh, this is a cable, a cable transmits electricity, so probably that's kind of how this computer works. Uh, of course, that doesn't tell you at all what a computer is. Um, so, I mean, I think this would be certainly one of the very big challenges in the next, uh, the next 50 years or so, is to try to build some kind of mathematical model of how the brain works so that actually allows to say something interesting, right? rather than just describing the mechanics of how neurons work. Not only are you a famous mathematician, but you are also an entrepreneur. You've uh, developed uh, Amadeus, a sound editing and recording device for Mac uh, software. Um, do you think that researchers make good entrepreneurs? Well, okay, it's not very common for at least mathematicians uh, to become entrepreneurs or to have some sort of extracurricular activity of this type, so mm. to speak. Uh, but it does actually happen. I mean, I'm certainly not the only one. Mm -hmm. <laughs> Uh, who has these type of activities. Uh, usually it happens more often with applied mathematicians. So sometimes applied mathematicians come up with something that has a very direct uh, practical application and then they would create a company to market this. Mm. Um, it happens, you know, so for example now with the discovery of graphene, like in physics it happens much more often. Uh, many start startup companies are created by professor or in universities and then they get spun off uh, from the university. Like for example in Manchester with this graphene, now they, you know, there are several startup companies that were created and that you know, do more engineering research rather than fundamental research and with the aim of produ producing consumer products. So I think it's, you know, it's not so uncommon, even if for pure mathematicians it's maybe not so common. <laughs> Uh, do you have a piece of advice for students from Ecole Polytechnique who consider doing a career in mathematics? Would you encourage them? Um, well, I would say if they like mathematics and they're interested in it, um, then I would certainly encourage them. There are still many things to do. There are many interesting open problems. Um, so, piece of advice, I think... So there are, there are some mistakes that one tends to make as a young researcher. Um, so one typical mistake is to, to focus too much on one's problem. So you know, your PhD advisor gives you some problem to think of, and then you think you have to solve this problem, and so you focus all of your attention on this, and you forget everything else. Um, this is maybe efficient on a very short-term basis, but it's not very efficient in the long run. So it's a, I think people should, so even if you mostly focus about your research problem, you should still take the time to get interested in other things that a priori seem to have nothing to do with your research, um, and to gain a little bit of a broader overview and some kind of general culture. Um, another mistake that people tend to make is to, to jump on bandwagons. Like there is a topic which is the hot topic mm. right now, and so you have to jump on this topic and work in this topic if you're young and ambitious and <laughs> want to succeed. And that's not the only way to succeed. So I think it's more important uh, to choose topics that you like and that you, you know, sort of really have some actual interest in than just choosing a topic because it's hot at the moment and you know everybody has to work on this hot topic. Martin Herrer, thanks a lot for being with us today. You're very welcome. <laughs>